Hello, I'm Pastor Chuck Seilstad, Senior Pastor of Center Points Christian Fellowship. I want to welcome you today as we get into our teaching, and we're now in part two of the Rapture of the Church Studies, where we're looking at the timing of the rapture. Now, our current discussion is on viewpoint number five, which is the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Now, the rapture of the church is the time when the church will be lifted off or taken away from the earth to meet the Lord in the air. Uh, that we, we find that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. Now, we're almost completed with our examination of the differing viewpoints about the rapture of the church. And as I've stated all along, the pre-tribulation view, which I adhere to, points to prophetic chronological clues that indicate that the rapture will take place prior to the tribulation period. Now, in this viewpoint, it shows that the New Testament is consistent in its anticipation that the return of Christ might occur at any moment before the tribulation. Today, we're going to start uh, with stating that God rescues the church before judgment comes. That means that he'll rapture us before judgment comes upon the earth. Now, God's people must first be taken out of harm's way before the coming of divine judgment on the earth that happens during the tribulation period. Let's look at a few examples. First of all, Enoch. Now, I don't necessarily use Enoch, but many scholars say Enoch was physically transferred to heaven before the judgment of the flood. And I know that he was taken out uh, while he was still alive. But of course, uh, that was many years prior to the event of the flood. But God took Enoch with him because of their relationship. And many scholars believe that Enoch is being reserved for the position as one of the two witnesses in Jerusalem during the tribulation period. Now that's possible, but it doesn't have to be him. Uh, another example is both Noah and Lot. Now they were living at different times, but Noah and his family were in the ark before the judgment of the flood. Now Lot was after the flood, but he was taken out of Sodom before judgment was poured out on Sodom and Gomorrah. It says in Luke 17, 26 through 30, just as I was, it was, not me, but just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Now, likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building on the day when Lot went out from Sodom and fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. Well, so it will be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So see, here Christ explains that in order to understand God's pattern for end-time judgment, these two historical events must be studied and comprehended. These two events, the flood that came in Noah's day, as well as the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in the days of Lot. Well, what do both events have in common? Well, in both instances, God's people were removed from harm's way before judgment came. So we see that throughout the scripture, God is seen protecting his people before judgment falls. Now, Peter made the identical point in 2 Peter 2, 5 through 9. He says, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on the ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them uh, to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the depraved conduct of of the lawless for that righteousness man, uh, that righteous man living among them that a day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he heard and saw. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue the ungodly, or the excuse me, He knows how to rescue the godly from trials to hold the unrighteous for punishment on the day of judgment. Now, linguistically. Peter's point here constitutes an extended if-then clause. The if portion states that the premise and the then portion furnishes the logical conclusion. So the if portion or the premise is found in verses 4 through 8. The then portion or the conclusion is found in verse 9. Now Peter's point 
is that if God protected Noah and his family safely in the ark before the floodwaters, uh, when they came upon the earth, and if God similarly removed Lot before Sodom was destroyed, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from the temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. So here, Peter re-articulates what Christ already said in Luke chapter 17, 26 through 30. So if both historical events, the flood and Sodom, if you take those two, God's people were removed from harm's way before judgment came. Now, there's some other examples. Uh, what are some other examples of God saving people before the disaster struck? Well, what about the firstborn among the Hebrews in, in Egypt were sheltered by the blood of the Passover lamb before judgment fell? Or what about the spies? They were safely out of Jericho and Rahab was secured before judgment fell on Jericho. Now, some might question the use of symbolic parallels since the Old Testament also contains examples of God's people going through the tribulation, through different types of tribulation. Well, in such instances, believers are not exempted from trials, but rather God protects his people in the midst of them. You see that in Isaiah 43, 2, Daniel 3, 19 through 27, Daniel 6, 16 through 22. In other cases, God's people experience the martyrdom in the midst of tribulation. In Hebrews 11, 36 through 38. However, notice that many of these examples concern God's program for Israel rather than the church. And as explained in prior articles, God deals differently with Israel than he does with the church. Now, not in salvation, but in other things. God's future program for Israel involves the remnant coming to faith in Jesus in the midst of the coming tribulation. That's Jeremiah 30, verse 7, and Zechariah 12, 10. But the Lord specifically tells us to focus on the days of Noah, talking about the church, on the days of Noah and Lot in order to understand his pattern of end-time dealings. Pre-tribulationalists believe this also shows that the church be, will be secured safely by means of the rapture before the judgment falls in the tribulation period. God's mode of operation seems to be to rescue his people before his judgment falls on the unbelievers. Now, look at uh, interesting scripture parallels. Uh, the description of the rapture in 1 Thessalonians uh, 4, 16 through 18, they share some interesting parallels with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. This second passage tells us what Christ has done for us. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 10, and 11, it says, Who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you were doing. Now note, these two similarities, these similar, not just two, but these similarities, uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 uh, uh, to 18, and 1 Thessalonians 5, 10 through 11. It says, The dead in Christ, and it says asleep. It says, we are who are alive and are awake. Uh, these different verses. Uh, encourage one another. The other one says, encourage one another and build with these words. Another one says, uh, build one up with another. Now, in this view, a number of scholars believe uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 10, and 11 refers to the rapture just as 1 Thessalonians 5, 13 through 17 does. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18 also seems to parallel or to share some parallels with Jesus' description of the rapture in John 14, 1 through 3. We look at that in John 14, uh, uh, 1 through 3, Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, and, and it says, I will come again. And, the, and then it says, the Lord himself will descend from heaven. We see, I will take you to myself. The other passage says, believers will be caught up together. Then you see that where I am, we may be always be with you or with be also with the Lord. So we're seeing these parallels here. What about one that says, let not your hearts be uh, that you may be grieved or troubled or encourage one another with these words. We're, we're seeing these parallels here and these similarities clearly indicate that both passages are referring to the same event, the rapture of the church. And the scriptural evidence reveals that it takes pr place prior to the beginning of the tribulation period. 
we can see that what about the rapture uh, and the second coming? We need to see these. There's a difference here. The rapture has to be distinguished from the second coming of Christ. The rapture and the second coming of Christ are often confused. So there has to be clarification needs to take place in our minds to understand the difference because people confuse those scriptures. Sometimes it's difficult to determine whether a scripture verse is referring to the rapture or to the second coming. However, in studying end times prophecy, it's very important to differentiate between the two. We have to differentiate between them. At the rapture, the Lord comes in the clouds to meet us in the air. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-17. At the second coming, the Lord descends all the way to earth and, his, and Jesus' feet touch the Mount of Olives, resulting in a great earthquake followed by a defeat of God's enemies. We see that in Zechariah 14, 3 through 4. Now, at the rapture, Christ will come for his saints in the air prior to the tribulation, whereas the second coming, he will come at the end of the tribulation with his saints to the earth to reign for a thousand years. We can see that in, in Revelation 19 and also in Revelation 20, verse 1 through 6. Now, the fact that Christ comes with his holy ones, his redeemed believers, at the second coming presumes that they have been previously raptured. In other words, Christ cannot come with them until he first comes for them. He'll come afterwards, he'll come um, with them, but he has to come before then to come, you know, to take them up to, with him so that they can come with him at the second coming. Because see, every eye will see Jesus at the second coming. We see that in Revelation uh, 1.7, but the rapture is never described as being visible to the whole world. See, there appears to be a reversal that takes place between the two events. At the rapture, Christians are taken and unbelievers are left behind, whereas at the second coming, unbelievers are taken away to judgment and mortal believers remain to enter into Christ's millennial kingdom. So see, there's a difference between these events. 1 Thessalonians uh, 4, uh, 13 through 17, Luke 17, 34 through 36, and also Matthew 25, 31 through 46. You can see those verses. Now, at the rapture, Jesus will receive his bride, whereas at the second coming, he will execute judgment. The rapture will take place in the blink of an eye, instantaneous, whereas the second coming will be more drawn out. Uh, more will take place, and every eye will see him. Uh, some verses to look at is Matthew 25, 31 through 46, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, uh, Matthew 24, 30, and also Revelation 1, 7. Now, those are in my notes, so I, I'm, I know I'm going fast, but the rapture and the second coming are similar, but separate events. Both in, involve Jesus returning. Both are end times events. However, it's critically and crucially important to recognize the differences. The rapture is the return of Christ in the clouds to remove all the believers from earth before the time of God's wrath. The second coming is the return of Christ to the earth to bring uh, to the tribulation to an end and to defeat the Antichrist and his evil world power and his empire. Now we can also look at the bride and the bridegroom. See, scripture portrays, portrays Christ as the bridegroom and the church as the bride of Christ. We see that in John 3, 29, Revelation 19, 7. See, the backdrop to this imagery is rooted in the Hebrew wedding, where it includes three phases. The first phase is the marriage was legally established by the parents of the bride and the groom, after which the groom left to prepare a place to live in his father's house. Now, the bridegroom returned to claim his bride. But the groom doesn't know when he will come back for his bride until the father tells him it's time to claim his bride. Now, the, the marriage uh, was celebrated with a feast. That's the third phase. It was celebrated with a feast that lasted several days. But all three of these phases are seen in Christ's relationship to the church or the bride of Christ. Now, as, as individuals, First of all, living during the church age, come to salvation under the Father's loving and sovereign hand, they become a part of the bride of Christ, which is called the church. Meanwhile, Christ 
the bridegroom, they're left, uh, he, he left earth and is in heaven preparing a place for his bride of Christ uh, to live in his, in his father's house. That's what's happening now. Only the father knows when the rapture will occur and when it's time to rapture his bride, which is the church. And the father tells his son, Jesus, it's time to claim your bride. Now, the next thing in the parallel of the Hebrew wedding is the bridegroom returns to claim his bride at the rapture, at which time he takes his bride to heaven where he has prepared a place for her. And we see that in John 14, 1 through 3. And, and understand, that's us, the worldwide believers in, the, in, in Christ. We're the church, all the believers in the world. See, the actual marriage takes place in heaven. We see that in Revelation 19, 7 through 9 prior to the second coming, which is in verses 11 through 16. And then thirdly, many people believe that the marriage supper of the Lamb happens in heaven while the tribulation period is taking place on earth. Others believe the event follows the second coming prior to Christ's institution of the millennial kingdom. But this would take place during the gap between uh, that's mentioned in Daniel 12, 11 through 12, Compare it with Matthew 22, 1 through 4, uh, 14, and then 25, 1 uh, through 13 in Matthew. But during the tribulation, more likely it fits there within Revelation narrative, in the narrative in Revelation, because this event is for Christ uniting with his bride, the church. And there are other parallels as well. But the Jewish groom paid a price, a purchase price, to establish the marriage covenant and Jesus paid a purchase price for the church with his blood on the cross. A Jewish bride was declared sanctified or set apart in waiting for her groom, and the church is declared sanctified and set apart for Christ, the bridegroom. We can see in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, Ephesians 25, uh, 5, 25 through 27. We can see in Matthew 25, 11 through 12, it says, Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. See, he doesn't know, uh, they don't know when the bridegroom's going to come. A Jewish bride was unaware of the exact time her groom would come for her. And the church is unaware of the exact time that Jesus, the bridegroom, will come at the rapture. Although we do know that his coming is imminent. It's going to happen at any time. And that's just like the Jewish bride. She knew that it could happen at any time. And we know the church that, that the rapture can take place and happen at any time. So Jesus says, watch. See, concerning his rapture of the church, Jesus said, watch and be ready. And he gave a series of parables emphasizing the importance of watching and the importance of being ready. Matthew 24, 37 through 38, it says, For as were the days of Noah, so will the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. See, these people were caught by surprise when the flood came. It was business as usual. They weren't expecting the judgment of God to take place or to come. Jesus is saying that the condition of the world will be in with it when he comes for his church. It's going to be that way, like the days of Noah. See, while the world is going about their normal business, the rapture will catch them by surprise. In Hebrews 9.28, we read, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting him. He's going to save them from judgment. See, the Lord expects us and wants us to be watching for him. He expects and wants us to be ready when he comes. See, we, we should be watching. It means that we live each day in continual anticipation and expectancy with the conviction that Jesus could come at any time. Okay. So I'm going to close for today, and we're going to pick up where we left off next week to continue the discussion of the pre-tribulation rapture, the viewpoint uh, uh, number five of the church, the, the pre-tribulation rapture, and we'll conclude this series of teaching. In other words, next week I'm going to finish talking about the rapture and all the different timing, 
and we'll move on to another subject the following week. But for now, I want us to just take time to pray. And, and then, like I said, next week we'll come back and we'll continue on and finish off this, this teaching. So, Lord, we just thank you for today. I ask that you would give us your strength, give us your wisdom, give us your, your knowledge and understanding, and help us to be good scholars of the word. Bless us today, open up our minds, and help us to know what you desire us to know. And we thank you for it. Help us to be ready. In your precious holy name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you for joining in with me today for this message. To find out more about Center Points Christian Fellowship, uh, just go to uh, my website at www.info at centerpoints, or excuse me, www.centerpoints.org. If you would like to know more about us, go to info at centerpoints.org and send me an email. So you can see on our website and in the narrative on YouTube and Facebook, you can find a link to our YouTube channel with all our video messages recorded so far, including this one. Uh, you can also sign up for our weekly newsletter, uh, which gives you information and some details and updates about our services and other things going on. Uh, you can find that out. And you can also join us on Wednesday night Bible study and women's Thursday morning Bible study. All you have to do if you want the newsletter or any of these other things you want to do, uh, just send me an email requesting it at info at centerpoints.org. So until I see you again, stay safe and may God bless you and have a great day.